think that the preparation was just in the practice and the exposure and getting used to it and being judged for, for being, you know, a woman, absolutely. Or, or being, um, you know, presumptions made of course, and that works to your advantage or your disadvantage. Today's show is sponsored by Enigma Elements. As filmmakers, we're always looking for ways to level up production value of our projects and speed up our workflow. This is why I created Enigma Elements, your one-stop shop for film grains, color grading LUTs, vintage analog textures like VHS and CRT images, smoke, fog textures, DaVinci Resolve presets, and much more. After working as an editor, colorist, post, and VFX supervisor for almost 30 years, I know what film creatives need to level up their projects. Check out enigmaelements.com and use the coupon code IFH10 to get 10% off your order. I'll be adding new elements all the time. Again, that's Enigma, E-N-I-G-M-A, elements.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Courtney Lauren Penn. How are you doing, Courtney? I'm great, Alex. Thank you for having me on the show. Been a thank big you. fan for a long time, so. Oh my God, thank you so much. That's extremely humbling. I always find it so insane when people of your magnitude and and, and stature in the business say that to me, because I'm like, I don't know who's listening, but occasionally I'll get somebody who's like, oh, I've been listening forever. I'm like, what? <laughs> All of those that have done the hustle appreciate the indie film hustle. <laughs> so I appreciate you coming on. Your partner in crime and in your new pro, in your new pro, uh, company, Renegade Entertainment, came on last uh, last week. Uh, Mr. Thomas Jane, the incomparable Thomas Jane, which was an amazing conversation about uh, about his pr- perspective on producing and and bankable actors and all this kind of stuff. So today we want to get into the weeds about producing and working in the budget levels that you're working in and the kind of projects you're working with Tom and so on and so forth. But before we get into that, why in God's green earth did you want to jump into this business? It's <laughs> <laughs> a great question. Um, I was told not to for a really long time, which probably fueled my, uh, my drive to do so. Um, I, I grew up on the East coast and I played chess actually. So through chess, I met some really interesting filmmakers who are, there's a really interesting camaraderie in the, between the film and chess community, believe it or not. There's a lot of actors who play a lot of directors. Um, there's something about the discipline. And um, I got exposure in high school to um, a man named Josh Waitskin, who was oh, the subject of the movie. So, oh, you know, Josh. Oh, I know, I know, I don't know him personally, but I know of him. Absolutely. He's a, a, a MMA uh, or um, yeah, MMA Thai guy. champion. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, he's I read his book. It's an amazing book. Oh, the art of the art of learning. Oh, it's amazing. I love that. Book. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so I got to read one of the because he was a good friend of mine. So he sent me the early drafts when he was like penning it and all that stuff. But I met Josh and I am a huge fan of Tim Ferriss and Tim and Josh are sort That's of very I, close. And their podcasts together oh. are like just there's some Gold. of the best. Right. Gold. Gold. Yeah. Completely. Um, Josh lives, lives full. Like he, 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 he lives life, you know, uh, incomplete, but anyway, I met him and I was probably 10 or 11. I was a young chess player and I met him at the time when all the, the, the hoopla of, uh, searching Robbie Fisher was sort of, was sort of happening. And, um, I watched this film and I'd already played chess, but what was so incredible about this movie was how, if you play, and if you're uh, in part of a family of chess players or if you're around it and you know how familial the, the community requires you to be if you're a kid playing, it just got to the heart. And um, I, I think that that screenplay and what that film accomplished felt so deeply powerful and emotive that I, I just remember thinking that this crossover was really, really powerful. And then what that film did for the chess world was so incredible and powerful. And then through that, I met my first mentor, Josh Waitskin, and, you know, um, and, and, you know, ultimately, you know, played chess, always loved film and storytelling. And I was, and I started writing short stories, but I never imagined I would end up creatively sort of in the business. Um, and I went to school. Um, they were, recruited me for chess. I got to go to school and play and all of that. And I was always writing. Um, and then, um, I ended up going to wall street and doing investment banking mergers and acquisitions, which, you know, transactionally speaking, you know, very much like setting up and creating a film. Every film is a small business, as you know, very well, you know, this better than anyone. Um, and so you're starting a business from scratch 
you're ramping it up and then you're selling it and, and parsing it off. And so it's sort of, you know, it was very similar to this transactional understanding uh, that I got from MA. So in terms of the structured finance side, I kind of got a lot of understanding basics from my world, my time in that world. Um, and then I kind of followed my heart. Uh, I left banking and I went and studied film uh, at NYU and broke the news to my parents. I wasn't going to go to medical school for an MD MBA. I was going to go pursue film. And uh, I, I, you know, I did, I just, I didn't really know anyone in the business um, at all and sort of just went and started the learning um, about where the intersection between that creative process that happens um, over here. And then the business side that I had, you know, understood this entrepreneurial mindset of how, you know, businesses start running, get sold. Where does, where's that cross section? And I found independent film finance and, uh, started a little company and eventually now we're here, full fledged renegades. So you, you jump, but you were, you also did a little acting along the way. No, no. You never did any acting? I saw nope. your I saw, in your IMDb. I saw you. You had oh, like play, I, I, you play I, some parts. <laughs> no, no. I mean, because um, we met Ron Howard through chess, and so Ron was gracious and super kind, and I became friendly with Bryce and Paige, and actually taught Paige chess on occasion. Oh. And he invited us out to um, the movie set for Ed TV. And I was there sort of as a, as a child, I was playing in a chess tournament nearby. And then the, and then the days off would be going to set with Ron. And it was a surreal experience as a kid, you know, watching, we were walking through the streets of San Francisco and we have people opening their windows and shouting down to them and following us on the street. And it was a really, it was the first time that I was walking with Woody Harrelson, it was Woody Harrelson and Brian Grazier and Ron and me. And I just remember this weird you know, moment of, wow, this is what it's, this is what that's like. This is what, you know, when you're no longer have a private life, that's right. what this is, you know? Um, and they were calling him by his name from the show. And it's like, I'm blanking on it right now. Um, Ron, when he was a kid. Um, oh, um, oh, uh, the, the, uh, Opie, Opie. Opie. They were calling Opie. Opie. Yeah. You know, that's what they were doing. And I, you know, and he was so gracious, but I just remember it made a huge imprint. And, and what, what, what really was interesting is because Ron Howard to me was just this really nice guy who had this fascinating job and he was so sensitive and gentle. And he allowed us my, to come into his editing room and he would show us how he'd craft a scene and cut a scene and the art of it was such a beautiful thing. And he was so humble about it. And I couldn't connect that you know, the cacophony of that public experience with the actual like art, you know, how private the art form creation was. It was just, I'll never forget that experience. Anyway, Ron on that set was like, Hey court, do you want to, would you like to be in a scene? You know? So he put me in some, some scenes and, you know, I was background or whatever. And then, um, and then recently um, I, I did a scene with my son um, uh, at the end of a film and we, my son and I, um, because I wanted to memorialize my son at such a young age in film and uh, Ryan Quantin, the star of this movie uh, called Section 8 that has yet to come out, um, his entire journey is about um, the loss of his son. And so he gets into a bus at the end and he sits in the back and he sees a young mother and her son kiss and it, it, it wraps his story in a bow. And it's really, it's really, sorry, I get teary eyed to see that. It was really powerful. So oh, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, that was just something I wanted to do for me and my son. So. How uh, you're fascinated. Your story is fascinating because you lived in the world of chess and I am a, I, I wish I could play chess at the level that Josh and you guys play. Um, no, Josh, yeah, I was you know, Josh. Okay, Josh, you, and then I'm somewhere on the floor. <laughs> Um, but I'm fascinated with like, I, it's one of my searching for Bobby Fisher is one of my favorite movies of all time. I absolutely oh, adore. Oh. I've seen that movie a thousand times. I'm obsessed with Bobby Fisher in general. I saw the documentaries. Oh my God. Um, the, the queen's gambit. I couldn't just, I mean, I'm, I love chess and I love the idea of moving chess and, and thinking 50 steps ahead and all this kind of stuff. How did your training in chess help you navigate the sometimes treacherous 
world of filmmaking, of the film industry, especially coming from a female perspective, which is, you know, not generally, uh, you know, especially in the producer, female producer situation, there's not a lot of you. There are more now than there were before, but I, as you were coming up, I'm sure there wasn't many that you could like speak to and talk to. And I've had a few on the show, but there, I could count them on one hand <laughs> as they were coming up, like it was a tough situation. So how did Chess prepare you for that? You know what? I think you kind of nailed it. Um, you know, there weren't that many women in chess. Now there are so many more, you know? Right. So when I started playing, it was the early nineties. So, um, I remember playing in Washington square park as Josh did actually. Um, and playing with the guys he used to, you know, he used Speed to chess. play with, with Speed chess. And that's where I, and I remember being this, you know, young girl and the guy, and it was just, you know, they would come around, you know, all the guys in the park and they, and they would say, this is girl, she's playing, you know, can she really play? And, you know, okay. You know, I, I started to do better and better and I, and I did win, but there was a, you know, uh, it, it wasn't the most common thing. And then I remember going to play in tournaments. You know, I, I, I did, I did play, um, you know, scholastic and traditional tournaments. So I would play in New York at the Marshall chess club and the Manhattan chess club. And there were no women, there were no girls. There were about three, you know? Um, and you know, you were always playing against men. And I think that that's, was very similar to, you know, investment banking was still pretty male dominated also. Right. Um, then when I was, when I was in it, um, I think I was the only woman banker at my small firm. It was a boutique firm of less than like 15 people. Um, I was the only, you know, uh, on the banking team there was, um, and then, uh, going into film, same, same sort of idea. Now there are many, many more women, but I think that the preparation was just in the practice and the exposure and getting used to it and being judged for, for being, you know, a woman, absolutely. Or, or being, um, you know, presumptions made of course, and that works to your advantage or your disadvantage. You know, it really does. Um, and, and on all, in all spheres. So by the time you got to the film business, you were old hat between finance, chess, you were old hat, <laughs> like, like dealing with this situation. Yeah. I was, I was, I was sort of accustomed to it. Although, you know, um, there is a significantly more cutthroat, as you know, um, uh, there's a more of a cutthroat world in, in film, unfortunately, and TV and entertainment, you yeah. know, in, in general. And so I think people are so much when you're, when they meet you, they're so anxious to put you into a category. Like, they have this. to put you in a, they have to put you in a box. They have oh, to. immediately. Like they, they shake your hand and you're, you're in this, you're in the silo and you know, they don't want to move you out of it. And, and, and it's, and that's, that's one thing that's different, you know, in chess, if you beat a, if you beat, you know, an older male Russian master and everyone, and you were at the tournament, you, you own, that was your accomplishment. People looked, you know, recognized it. You know, what's so funny I had, and please forgive me for dropping a name, but when I had Jason Blum on the show, Jason, it's revolutionized film film finance and his deal is obscene and it's like how he got what he did and he said that he still is not respected in town tyler perry is still not respected for the insane things that he has done over in georgia and built his career because he's not in a box that makes sense to anybody so there's no respect in many ways to these 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 kind of people who have been able to do things completely outside the system and able to, to it, it, so you're right. And if they don't, they got to put you in like, okay, you're the girl producer. Okay, great. You're the Latino director. Great. You're the, this, the, they, they can't just keep it open. Why is that? You think? I think that humans are predictability seeking machines. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think there's a, because of the business because of the business's cutthroat mechanism, I think everyone went through it on their way up. So once they've reached a certain level, there's like a, just a, you know, well, this is what, how I was perceived. And so therefore I will continue on that to protect sort of my, my world I've, I've carved out for myself. I think that's part of it. I've, I've seen, I've noticed a lot that there's a lot of earnestness that you, you know, you come into this business with and you recognize it in others. And over 15 years, you can recognize it maybe 
maybe uh, having become, you know, a little bit more embittered, you know, you can see that. And then that in turn causes, you know, changes in behavior. And so you kind of, you kind of have to keep that tension of, you know, you know, of, of keeping your eye on the prize, wanting to be productive, keeping good relationships, but also standing, you know, being able to stand up for yourself. And so it's a, it's a constant tension. You, you, you know, this. So. No, it's, it's, in, it's insane. It's like this, the pressure that is applied your, your, the pressure you apply to yourself, first of all, is one thing. And you, you throw your own obstacles in front of yourself because of your own monkey brain and negative thoughts that you have in your own head. But then the business just pounds you. Like I was watching, I think it was Dave Chappelle who was on the actor studio years oh, ago. Oh, that was a great actor studio. Wasn't that amazing? And he's like, there are no weak people in our business. Like if you, if I'm on this, if you're in this stage right now talking to you, James, there's nobody who's talking to you that's weak. And I was like, it's like, you know what? He's right. Because to be able to achieve a certain level of success in this business, the amount that you need to, the amount of punches that you need to take. And even if you achieve success early in life, like look at like Josh, Josh, uh, you know, he really was thrown into the spotlight at a very young age. He did not like it. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he hated, he hated it, but yet there's still punches that come even at that level. I mean, you see child child actors and people that start up, but I think that's the thing that a lot of filmmakers getting into the business and people trying to get into business, they don't are not aware of the amount of punishment that you will have to endure to continue in this business. And the ones who endure the longest is not necessarily the most talented or right. the most moral or the nicest. It's, it's really, a, it's really a, a question of how much can you endure? And I always use the Rocky Balboa quote from the from when he was talking to his son in Rocky Balboa, it's it like, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. And that's, that's what this business is. It's like, you're constantly getting punched. You're always being brought to your knees. Oh, it was Joe Carnahan said it on your show. I think it's like running the gauntlet. You think you're going to run that gauntlet and not catch some (laughs) scars and marks. Like (laughs) Exactly. He he visually got it. Absolutely. Oh, oh, I love that. I love, I love Joe. I've got, you know, one of my favorite films uh, is the gray and um, one of the greats, right? Oh, amazing. Amazing. Like what, what it like, it's Liam Neeson with glass wrapped around his, his fist fighting a wolf. That's the, and Thomas was supposed to do that film. Actually. Was he? Was he? Yes, he was. He was supposed to play the role that I think Frank Grillo ended up playing. And it's like, you know, that funny, funny world. But anyway, I love Joe and he he's been in it and knows, knows that, but you're right. And I, and I think that you have to try to steal yourself. I know I like the measurements I'm always kind of taking is okay. This terrible, you know, thing happened or a punch was thrown to use your, your turn of phrase. And how are you going to let it impact you? You know, um, and so I think that you have to be so aware of how you let it impact you. Like you, there's things, you know, you never, you never pay that stuff forward. You know, you, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't. And no, it's you hard. Can't. But, I, but I see people who that does happen and you're, and you kind of, it's sad because you say, oh, when they entered the business, they had this earnestness and now they've got caught up in the wounds of, of coming up, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, 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 it, you know, and I, that's what I do the show for really is to really let everybody know. Like I always say, most filmmakers don't even know they're in a ring, let alone in a fight. Uh, and then all of a sudden they just get punched out of nowhere. And they're like, where'd that punch come from? I thought we were in a nice, you know, in, in, in a rosy field. I'm like, no. <laughs> is most of your audience creative filmmakers, directors and writers, mm-hmm. or are they, are they finance producers? Everybody. everybody. I've, I've taught, I've, it's fascinating because I talk, I've, you know, in the business and I, it's a small, it's a small town. Everybody knows everybody. It really is. It's so true. So as I've been making friends over the years, I find out who listens to me. So like you, you know, like, oh, I'm a fan. I'm like, great. Ed Burns been listening to me for years. I'm like, oh, really? Oh, that's so great. I'm like, what? What are the great indie creators? Yeah. So there's producers, there's financiers that reach out to me. There's distributors who reach out to me. So everybody from every aspect of the business 
either listens to, to the show or watches the show. You know, there's a segment represented in it. So it's not specifically just creative. It's because we, we talk about creative, especially when we're talking to, you know, certain directors about the craft and stuff, but really it's about the business about how to succeed, how to break through your own imposter syndrome, which we all have. And, you know, and, and, and listening to journeys of everybody. And I try to humanize these giants in the business to like, you know, when you're talking to Joe Carnahan and, and Joe tells me the story of how he, and you know, he left Mission Impossible 3. I'm like, what? And like, how'd that work out? And and his whole story. And like, so it kind of humanizes him and lets everybody know what the realities of the business are. Cause I never got that. I, I had to learn it the hard way. You know, my first book was based on me almost making a $20 million movie for the mafia uh, when I was 26. So I have a lot of shrapnel along the way that I've picked up. Um, and I wanted to, you know, kind of give that information out to the audience. And, you know, that's, that's the reason I do it. So anyway, but let's go back on track. Uh, <laughs> so when you're, when you're producing, what do you look for in a director? Because a lot of directors are delusional and I was delusional as well. Uh, we think that like, you know, we, we think that we're like, I, it's my genius. When are they going to recognize my genius? What are the traits that you look for in a director that you're going to help produce a film for? Oh, let's see. It depends if you're talking about film or TV. Mm -hmm. So, you know, luckily we were, so we're sort of in several, you know, production categories We're we're, you know, doing TV and streaming um, series. And then we're also doing, you know, independent film and, and we're also, we're in a, we're in a few categories. So um, on the film side, you know, well, on the TV side, it's interesting because you have this really interesting um, tension again, between whether it's a showrunner who is known for being, you know, an incredible director as a standalone. And then you work with, you know, showrunners who can support sort of their vision, or it's the showrunner who is the whole thing, you know, who sort of is in the writer's room is also going to direct at least two of the eight episodes, if it's eight, um, you know, and is rotating with credit with the writers, you know, and, and that's sort of like a completely different beast. Um, so it really depends on what, on the TV side, like, where the um, investment on, from the intellectual property developments coming from, and I mean, and I mean that creatively, not just financially. So, so we have a we have a book um, that we've um, optioned from Stephen King that we're in development on called From a Buick Eight, and for us, looking for the partners to crack it, we actually sort of went for uh, a tastemaker filmmaker who's more he's a he's a writer director but the, he he's happy to direct this more and and let two really really well-known writers write the whole thing and so we so we, we approached it from how are we going to approach the whole series you know do we want to find the one guy the showrunner that a net, that certain network loves and and that he's going to take charge ownership of the whole thing and we're going to kind of be a part of that or are we going to piece this one together, which opens up the world of directors um, in a more open way. Um, and so it's very specific to what the IP is and where you, where, how you want it to live ultimately. Um, on the film side, you know, we get all kinds of packages that come to us. Sometimes the director's on a script and approaches us. Sometimes we're developing a script um, from the ground up. Uh, and then we're going to go look for a director. And that takes, that's quite a process, you know? I mean, uh, sometimes it happens very easily and quickly. And then sometimes you're still looking. There's a couple of projects that we've been looking for a year for the right creative partner as a director. And we're looking for someone, you know, because not just genre, but also wants to get into the weeds and the trenches and, and, and wants to, you know, make it at a certain budget level and, um, you know, and then all, you know, so it, it is, it, I'd say that navigating that and finding the right director is one of the hardest parts of producing. What advice would, what advice do you wish someone would have given you about being a producer in Hollywood? Um, be skeptical. <laughs> Great advice. Be, be, be skeptical um, because I've had so many people offer to, you know, help or 
say they were going to help and the motivations, you know, are not what you would hope that they are. Um, and I mean this for men and women, this is a, this is a universal blanket truth. Um, I, I, I also believe, and I believe in not becoming embittered, which takes hard work. So the work there is I sort of employ the Tim Ferriss, uh, and Josh is like, they have a great conversation, um, that I think was very helpful to me as a producer, their conversation about, um, Josh's tr- uh, trainer um, for his Thai Push Hands Championships. I, f- I forgot his name, but he's a, he's a legend. He's like live streams his training sessions. And it was, it was not for, it was not Push Hand. It's the other one. Um, oh God, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Okay. Yeah. He, yes. he live streams, he live streams his fights and his practices so his opponents can see all of his techniques. Yes. And Tim says, I will help anyone. And I apologize. My cat's going to just sort of arrive here in my lap. Uh, He's, I will help anyone and give them the tips that I wish I had when I was creating my four hour work week, when I was creating this and and, um, I'll just, I'll just give it because if someone can hack it and do it better than me, I can maybe learn from them. So I, I think that being less precious because you're going to meet so many people who are very precious. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that if you try to fight to stay precious, I think you can lose yourself and become hardened. So I would say be healthily skeptical and don't worry about being precious because there's a, I mean, there's a few straight facts, right? I mean, a film makes money if you make it for, you know, for, for less than it, and if you make it for less than what you're going to sell it for, like this isn't, you know, it, it's not rocket science, but people act, you know, so, you know, like actors values, like all of that information is, is, is actually quite accessible. Um, so I've sort of always been an open book with my, with my, with my knowledge. And so I think that that helps us all kind of get to a better place. So be skeptical of, you know, of, of what, uh, uh, be skeptical, healthily skeptical, um, heightened awareness. And then, you know, don't be, don't be, don't be so focused on being precious. Yeah, I know a lot of people, I, I found that interesting because in the film industry, there is that level of being precious with like, oh, I know something that you don't. And if I give it to you, you can overtake me kind of attitude where, the opposites happened to me. The second I started giving away all this information to people, doors started swinging open and I get to talk to people like you now that I, would, that I would have never, if I would have just been a filmmaker trying to hustle it out like everybody else was, and I just started trying knocking on your door, I met you at a party or something, it'd be so much more difficult to sit down to have a conversation with you. But yet now I can have a conversation and ask you any question I like about any the question. business, any question I like about the business and I benefit from it. And then I, as well, I record it. And now the rest of the world that's listening gets the benefit from it as well. So I found that to be the complete opposite is like the more you give, the more you connect with people, the more you're able to help other people. Um, yeah. Some of it's going to go off and be done. You know, people are not going to be nice about, you know, holding on to it or something like that. That's just human nature. But a lot of people will will remember it and help you along the way and and open doors for you. And And like you were saying earlier, the competitive advantage is like long term tenacity, you know, and so that's really the competitive advantage. You know, it's sort of like, oh, gosh, I don't want to bring up the trial, but Johnny Depp did say something really interesting the other day. He says Mm -hmm. he said lies run a sprint. The truth runs a marathon. And I think that that's great. brilliant. That's great, brilliant. right? Brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> and that's that. That goes to so many things, right? Everything from you know personal conduct to professional conduct. And I think that that speaks to that openness, right? It's sort of like if you've you know if you're willing and have the ability to like stick it out and kind of stay tenacious. And you're able to, the, the more I think you give, I really agree with you completely. The more that doors open, the more opportunity presents itself um, and growth happens. Now, we all have been on set and the world feels like it's coming crashing down on you. You're, you've lost location. The actor don't come out of the studio, out of his trailer. Um, financing, you can't pay the crew that way because the finance, the, the money didn't drop 
that you were promised that was going to drop, whatever that the scenario is, what was that worst day for you and how did you overcome it? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. How did you overcome it? The worst day. Early when, so when I first came into the business, I I was sort of helping rescue um, films that that were had already started going, and my first big opportunity was to go and help up, help clear up the uh, finish, help finish the production, and help clean up a film that was already in bankruptcy. And because of my background in finance, the investor who I met you know, said, I really need help. I'm in over my head. This film and several others are in bankruptcy. Can you help me? And it still needs to be finished. And it was a film called Gala Walkers with Wesley Snipes. And Wes is actually a, a friend and he is a terrific guy. And I, I just respect the heck out of him. He's, he's a, a unlimited talent and he's like, he got a very, very peaceful soul. Um, but in the making of that movie, um, he had to fly back for legal reasons, um, most of the way through production, um, to, to the United States. And, uh, that film was very compromised, uh, as a result of producers, poor conduct fiscally, um, the challenges there. It was a really, it was pretty much everything that could go wrong on a movie set. I think the accountant died on set in production. I mean, it was, yeah. And I mean, I came in now, I came in after this all had happened and this poor investor had millions of pounds invested in the film. And he said, you know, I don't know what to do. And he said, I've entered it into a bankruptcy proceeding to help clear up chain of title. I, what, what, you know, how, what can we do to maximize it? And I said, okay, well, let's talk it through. Let's look at the legal agreements. What does bankruptcy in the UK look like? So in the process of, you know, cleaning all that up, we had to address the missing footage. We had to recut the film. Um, We had to deal with existing uh, sales and licensing agreements that were predicated upon the earlier producers and what they had papered. And it was, you know, there, there were, there were just some the titanic mammoth issues that, you know, I remember waking up one day and just thinking this film is never going to see the light of day. Um, and you know, we have to do the right thing for this main investor and, um, you know, ultimately, uh, sort of figured it out, started just making phone calls, looking at the paperwork, learning about contracts, got it resold to Lionsgate. It did it. But it was just, I remember there was just a a cacophony of things that happened. Boom, 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 sort of all in a day. And, um, and, uh, you know, you got through it though. You got it. Yeah. You just, you go, okay. It's not going to look like how we expected, but there's always a solution. I mean, I've been involved with projects that you know, over, you know, a couple million dollar. What project. was yours? I want to know. Oh, what was oh, I mean, well, my worst day was, you know, almost making a movie for the mafia and, you know, being stuck in that for a year and a half. And my production office is being in a, uh, in a racetrack and, and my life being threatened on a daily basis for about a year from a psychotic guy who was basically Joe Pesci from Goodfellas. So one day he's once a moment, he's super like the funniest, wonderful guy in the world. And it's bipolar next second. He wants to, he's threatening me to throw me in a ditch and that's all great. But then I get flown out to LA and I meet the biggest movie stars in the world, the biggest power players. I'm at the Chateau Maman. I'm at the Ivy. I'm doing all this, that surviving that, being that close to your dream at a twenty as 26. 26. 26. Oh wow. Okay. 26. So sitting across the, the the desk from Batman, I actually met one of the actors who played Batman, and him telling you, I want to be in your movie. Do you want to sleep over tonight? Stay oh over my, my house so we can work on the script. So when you're that close and then everything gets completely yanked away from you, the psychological trauma that it took me two years to get out of it. It literally I almost went bankrupt. 
I just, it, my whole life got destroyed. So that to me was the, the, the lowest point in my entire life. So that's the biggest, st- everything else pales in comparison to that mm-hmm. experience. So I think that was also a way the universe was like, let's give him like the most ridiculous situation up front because he's never going to run into something this bad again. And so for me, everything else is, yeah, I've had problems and I've been part of projects that have, you know, fallen around or the, you know, the, the, um, the set gets flipped union flips it and they oh, lose that's money. Yeah, yeah. But then they lose their money and they have to wait a year and a half, two years looking for money to finish it. And the, and the footage is on my hard drive and I'm doing all the posts on it. And they, I'm like, there's some major stars in this movie. You guys can't find a hundred grand to finish this damn thing. So like all, all sorts of crazy stories over the years, but yeah, that's my, I mean, there's no way of, I mean, I can't, I can't, I always tell people, when I, when I wrote that book and it came out, I told people, if you want to know why, what, what's the source of the grizzled voice on the other end of this microphone, read the book and you'll understand. Listen the to what I sounded like when I was 26 and then hear me now. <laughs> I really used to talk like this, but then. <laughs> so um, you talk a lot about, um, you came from the financing world. So financing is the, the alchemy of our business. It is turning brick to gold and, and, you know, and, and turning lead to gold, excuse me. What advice, how do you approach financing? What is needed in today's world? Because financing five years ago, it's a lot different than financing in today's world, pre and post COVID, how the, the, the landscape has changed as far as who's buying, how much they're buying for, how much more competition there is. Um, is there as much money in finance available? Are there people, that many people jumping in, trying to want to jump into film? Because the word is out. I mean, it's not the easiest ride for financiers sometimes, unless you know what you're doing, like yourself. Right, right. So how do you, so how do you, how do you approach finance? And can you give any advice to, to uh, the people listening? Yeah, you know, I think if, you know, it depends if you are financing or if you're looking for financing, um, you know, and I, and I would say that um, if you're looking to finance, um, a, a track record doesn't necessarily, you know, mean that there's a financial track record. So, you know, you can have, you know, a track record as a producer of a lot of credits, but, you know, what with those films and how they look, you know, in the financial waterfall might be different. Um, Or on the other hand, you might, you know, have done very well as a producer by helping investors find pieces of films and that have been brought a wonderful return and it may not be the top tier credit on the movie. Um, so, I mean, I know that, you know, I had, I had raised um, money and we did like revolving credit of around, you know, between six and 10 million of uh, revolving sort of senior debt. And um, it was secured monies and we did really well with that model while, you know, this was in the, um, post 2011 era. So before, again, the streamers came in and, you know, film became international sales were, you know, deeply impacted by the advent of more upfront, just transactional buyouts from the streamers, you know, and TV, you know, purchasing prices fell internationally. Um, And so, you know, you're, you were starting to deal with margins for sales that were just more and more compressed. So your financial models just looked different. Um, And I think, I think that if you're looking to raise money and you're looking to finance film in this current marketplace, I think you have to just be much more on the dime in terms of what the market is right now, because it is different from now than it was three months ago. And it's going to be very different at this upcoming can than it will be in three months because the pandemic really, really did impact things in a massive way. And so, you know, people really didn't know what was going to happen um, to TV. Was there going to be any theatric at what point? So I think, I think you have to be so much more nimble for each project and you have to be able to, to just say, you know what, that film a few years ago would have been financed at six or 7 million. And today it's only three or four. Can we really make this movie at that level? And if we can't, okay, you know what, we have to maybe rethink it. Um, so I think, I think flexibility and, um, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of holding back domestic and not pre-selling uh, domestic as much as you can nowadays, because I do find 
that if you, you know what your minimum sale is. So truly, if you are just have someone financing against a minimum sale, there's, there is tremendous upside if you're working with trusted director, trusted filmmakers. Um, so let me ask you a question then. So I wanted to jump into distribution because distribution is also another mythical land, land uh, field or minefield of, 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 of situations. And I've, I've talked about distribution at nauseum on this show uh, because it's the one place that most filmmakers get taken advantage of, uh, you know, Hollywood accounting, all of this kind of stuff. And there's a lot of, there's are good, there are good players out there, but I've, in my experience, have discovered uh, that more of more or li- more, there are more bad players or, you know, great players than there are good players in the space. And I try to warn filmmakers about what, what the, 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 the marketplace is. And a lot of filmmakers come into the business today thinking it's 2005 and, you know, there's DVD pre-sales and like the, 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 those days are gone. And there's also the amount of competition that's out there for product. Right. I mean, there's just tens of thousands of features being thrown into the marketplace. Some with major stars, you know, good stars, others, that will never see a dime come back. How do you navigate the distribution fields? And I'm assuming that there's, I'm assuming before you answer, I'm assuming you've been taken advantage of once or twice along the way. Sure. Um, You know, I think, of course, I think um, I have never, ever, ever, ever um, provided a financial model to anyone for a project that involved any economics downstream of the initial MG for upfront sales. So I never, ever provided a model that promised, you know, even that, never, (laughs) not even that, but even, even when, you know, I don't even model in what it looks like when let's say you're licensing the film for seven years domestic, your return in seven years could then be an additional X percent. I, even though that that is there, I don't even I don't even value it. I don't discount it. I don't even I don't even do that. I, I you know for our purposes, budgeting is completely based off of just the upfront uh, MG. Or if you're able to say this is our minimum sale, we do believe you can sell it up to this. Here's the here's here's the minimum and here's the maximum. And I really rec- I always recommend holding back uh, domestic if you can. Um, if you again if you understand that that's truly your minimum, you know? Um, so, so to explain it to people. So when you're saying that, cause I know some people might be confused by that sure. when you're saying the minimum. So let's say you made a movie for a million dollars and you know, you have Thomas in it or something along, you know, a bankable actor mm-hmm. and you go, okay, based on the cast that we have, the genre that we have and the, the director and, and other couple, couple other elements, we can forecast that in the marketplace, we'll get an MG at the low end, maybe a 1.5, high end, maybe three. Mm-hmm. And that is, that's an MG, which is a minimum guarantee. So that's upfront check that they're going to give you. Then everything that comes afterwards, which is, you know, after, after they recoup that minimum guarantee, all the money that come afterwards, technically you're supposed to get a split of but a lot of times Hollywood accounting makes it that it's almost impossible. So the game that the, the season producers make now is like all the money you're ever going to make. Generally speaking, there's mm-hmm. exceptions. Generally speaking is the upfront cash. Anything after that, you will probably not see a dime until the, until the, until you get the movie back in let's say seven years. And maybe you can re license it at that point. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that's just for the financial model, you know, and I just think that's the most straightforward way. And then anything else is a bonus. I mean, if, if the, you know, we did, you know, for Gala Walkers, we did, we did actually re, uh, get overages from Lionsgate. Um, we did. Uh, I think it's the only film we've ever received overages for. <laughs> wow. Um, to that, says yeah. that says a lot. That says, that says a lot. Cause you've but, been making, you've made a few movies, <laughs> but you know, but we have three releasing this year. So, um, but yeah, but I mean that they did provide, you know, we did get over to from Lionsgate for Gala Walkers. Um, and so, you know, that was a happy surprise, but everything was based off of, you know, what, like, and then, so any modeling that we do now for sales and for financing, 
absolutely just based on off of like what I believe the true minimum is. And we'll, and we'll actually get that information. We'll work with, we have wonderful sales partners that are really trusted. We have a great, our agency is wonderful. Um, I love our, our, our team at Paradigm. Um, and, you know, so between them and our, our trusted sales partners that we work with um, and the distributors who we actually, you know, cultivated great relationships with some of the distributors that we, you know, I've had a, had a wonderful experience with Redbox. We did the last set of Isaac LeMay um, with Redbox and their marketing department and the way they ran the the release of that film. So impressed with with, with them. They're doing another film right now that Thomas is in called Vendetta. Um, it's been it's been tremendous. Um, so you know, I just think as you get more comfortable with certain distributors, um, I think too, there's just that you know the ability to say, okay, you know, we have a film that we're looking at doing. Where would you guys feel comfortable? Well, you know, oh, this is the rain. You know, it helps you back into your model sort of more. It's funny because I've heard Redbox is one of the best kept secrets in distribution. I've heard nothing but good things about them and the deals that they give out because they buy DVDs still. Um, uh, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's they right. Do, yeah, the DVD, it's the Redbox is actually, yeah. It's actually, so it's still old school DVD. So like if you get a full buy. It's a nice chunk of change, you know, for a smaller film. Like it's a it's, for a small, yeah. I think that they're very fair with their valuations, um, you know, because yeah. they, you know, and so you know, we did our film with Machine Gun Kelly and Sam Worthington and Thomas and Heather Graham. I mean, just an incredible cast, mm-hmm. um, and we shot that in the middle of the pandemic, um, and uh, you know. I was just, they, they did such a great job with the placement of it and, and how they promoted it. And I, you know, and like I said, which going to be repeat business. I really, really enjoyed working with them. Not to say that I haven't enjoyed working with our other partners at sure. you know, Kate and Simon, but just recently I, I looking back at the last couple of years, I just, I was really, I was, you know what it is too. I was appreciative because there's so much content you know, in the world so much that I think that it's really hard for all of these distributors to really even get their finger on the pulse of what's worth marketing and for how much and how long. And so, you know, in the old, old, old days, you know, executives would swear fealty to a project, right. And they'd shepherd it through and it was theirs and they would make sure that it got the marketing that it deserved and get the biggest push. And, you know, sort of that, that was part of their commitment and their job. And so now you have, you know, executives at the big streamers and the big companies, they've got so many things that they're, that they've got in front of them, you know, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. And so, you know, it's when you see a company that has the capacity to focus marketing efforts behind, you know, a film that you really believe in, you know, it it was really rewarding with with Redbox. And I think that's one of the things that a cast, a bankable star or, or, or a bankable cast does for a distribution company because they'll go, well, we're going to put money behind Thomas's movie because we know Thomas is going to get X amount of because he's Thomas or it's Danny Trejo or it's, you know, you can name a bunch of, you know, bankable stars. And they're like, we'll put money behind these these names because at minimum, we know that people will recognize it. And it's a, it's a low, lower hanging fruit for the distributor, as opposed to the old school 90s way of like, let's take Slacker and put it out into the theaters and see what happens. Let's see and, what happens. Yeah, I mean, the John Pearson, yeah. the John Pearson times, you know, like all that kind of, you know, let's see what happens with the, this Clerks and this El Mariachi. Like those days are so gone that, so many filmmakers still hold on to those days. And that's not the reality of where we are right now, which brings me to my next question. When you're putting together a package as a producer, not only how important is the cast, but can you express to the audience how invaluable it is depending on the budget? You're making a $100,000 movie, you're a lot more free. You're making a $5 million movie, Anything north of a million dollars, you you got to be very responsible with what you're doing. So cast is one way of ahead. It's one of the ways you hedge your bet. So can you talk a little bit about that? You know, it's become harder and harder. Uh, you know, margins are just more and more compressed because of the amount of content and because of the impact of the pandemic to, you know, you still to split rights and get great split rights deals in international territories that aren't necessarily there, um, you know, in the same way that they were. So, you, you know, you're, you're um, much more beholden to understanding what 
you're putting who and who and what you're bringing together in the package for a film. So, you know, you're thinking, you're thinking strategically um, for your, for your casting as well as creatively. I mean, I, it was, it was a huge boon to have someone um, of the musical caliber and presence internationally, Machine Gun Kelly and last son of Isaac LeMay, you know, he acts under the name Colson Baker. Um, But, you know, because of his, his overall brand and presence, it was a very different sort of, you know, it, it was an outside of the box casting decision and he, he worked so well, it, it, you know, he nailed the part. He was phenomenal in the movie, but um, it wasn't, it wasn't what you would, it wasn't the first, you know, instinctual thought maybe for casting. And so I think that, you know, you, when you're, when you, when you're saying, okay, I, I think you have to be much more strategic and think, you know, outside the box sometimes um, that when you're, when you're looking to cast to justify certain budgets um, and also to think about other audiences and who, who transcends, you know, a certain box, if you will, you know, mm-hmm. um, we're working with another, uh, in an upcoming project, I can't say yet, hasn't been announced, but another musical icon who's also an actor. Um, and, you know, we're thrilled um, because not, she is a phenomenal actor, but she's also got this incredible presence on the international stage. And, um, you know, it's, it's a really interesting opportunity. So I think you've got to, you've got to really just put things together um, and be a little bit mind bendy and, and how you, how you, and how you approach it. Now, you know, you've, you've made a bunch of movies over the years and many of them are in the, you know, the action genre. There's a lot of testosterone oh, yeah. in some of these films. How, yes. how I have to ask, I, this love for all the, I know. So I have to ask this for the female producers and directors listening. How do you navigate a testosterone heavy set production? Because I have to imagine that it comes with a different set of challenges, let's say, than, you know, a normal, a normal scenario, I, you know, and, and I, because I'm just like, I was, that was the first thing that was so impressive about I'm like, wow, she's made a lot of like action packed, like really testosterone film filled movies. I would love to hear her stories on how she was able to do all of that and have fun doing it and doing being successful at it. So much fun. Um, I've always loved action films. I probably was always a little bit of a, of a tomboy. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I think that though, I think that like with anything balance is wonderful. So when you have, you know, uh, this heightened energy on set and you've got, you know, horses and gunfire over here and you've got, you know, these incredible Titans of talent over there. And, and you're, I do think that there's a wonderful, I think, I think, I think women um, are really good producers. Not that men, I mean, men are wonderful producers too, but I think women have that because they tend to be more mothering in some ways. And I think that they bring yeah. like maybe, maybe a level of like more, a little bit of softness or there's something, you know, or a, a good ear. I just try to be a good ear when there's a, when there's a problem. So, you know, there was one actor uh, on a film who, you know, just, sort of, he was shooting some very intense scenes, um, you know, and I don't know if it was part of his, part of his style, um, but he sort of was, became very aggressive and loud and he did not want to come out of his trailer after that moment and left the set. And I think that, um, I think that if you can, you know, remove ego uh, and remove impulse and you can just try to connect to the person um as to why in the moment this is happening i think you can try to communicate and i think that that's been really helpful on a number of the films i've been involved with actually can you tell me about your new project with thomas jane uh tropo it's part of your new uh, company right renegade entertainment Yes. Um, so it's our first series and we're so lucky and happy. It's going to be sort of one of the first releases uh, for Amazon's Freebie brand, which was formerly IMDb TV. And so we're, it's a, like a Bosch spinoff show and Trapo are launching the retitled brand Freebie um, on May 20th. And it's been such an adventure because it came to us as a book and a draft of a pilot. And it was submitted to us a few years ago. And I read the 
pi- the draft of the pilot first. And um, I don't want to give a the, oh, there's an opening sequence to the to the show which you I you never you've never seen in film before, um, a little bit a la Jaws opening of Jaws and I just remember being grabbed and reactive and responsive and I and I read that pilot and I and I called Thomas and I said you know I'm going to read the book but we need to we need to look at at the whole project. Cause we haven't seen something like this before. Um, and read the book. I think that night didn't sit up all night reading it. It was called Crimson Lake by Candace Fox. And Candace is this incredible true crime writer, all true crime, but also fictional crime. And she used to write with James Patterson and co-author with him. And so she has this beautiful like metric and style of telling stories. that's so direct, but just so great and raw and cool. And, you know, it's a woman writing crime. I mean, she's just, she's just a great crime writer. And I, and I uh, fell in love with the story of Crimson Lake. And um, it's about this, it's about this American who's been in Sydney. He's a former detective. He ends up joining the force there and ends up getting accused of a horrendous crime um, that he, you know, didn't seemingly commit and sort of similar to the world that we're living in now, where like, if something is printed or stated on Twitter or the internet, or if someone prints something, it's just assumed to be true before, you know, it's, it's guilty until proven uh, innocent, um, now. And so we're seeing this play out right in front of us in many ways. And when I read this, this man's life was torn apart by an accusation um, and an arrest gone wrong. Um, and then his life was destroyed. His marriage, he had a young daughter. Uh, his whole life falls apart. And he he goes up to North Queensland to escape uh, everything and maybe end it all. And that's where we meet him. And we meet him in this strange place with wild creatures where everybody goes to kind of hide away from their whatever they're trying to get away from. And it played like a drama, like a true detective style sort of drama. And, you know, having, you know, seen so many genre pictures get made and being a part of that to, to see this great drama that was given the time to play out over eight episodes and that we could come in and work with the writers and crack it and focus on Ted and Amanda, the, the, the woman who he meets and they get into this mystery together up in Queensland. It was such a rare, really incredible experience and really rare. Um, and so we, we got into it with AGC uh, television, uh, Stuart Ford's company and a great group of executives there. And then Yolanda Ronke was um, brought on to show run and uh, Jocelyn Morehouse directed the opening uh, pilot episode and we shot it in uh, Australia during wild lockdowns. And that was a whole experience in and of itself. <laughs> and, um, you know, posted very quickly. And, uh, and, 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 and here we are. It's sort of like a pinch yourself moment, if you will. It's, ve- it's very jungle noir. Um, in, in the, in the, ah, in the jungle noir. That's a new term. Yeah. It's very jungle noir. It, it's it's brilliantly done, and uh, I I I suggest everybody listening de- definitely check it out on on fr- freebie freebie uh, freebie on Amazon. Just go on Amazon, look it up. You'll you'll find it there. Uh, okay, it'll be on the it'll be on the banner. The it'll top be on a big banner. Prime. Yeah. Now I have to ask you. I didn't get to ask Thomas this. How did you two get together? And- build renegade entertainment like you know after talking to him and after talking to you you guys have such different energies that i'm just curious how that meeting happened and how you've been able to build this up it's it's actually a great story um it actually speaks to what if you're having a hard time in the business what gravitational pull might keep you in it so um I've gone through some really tough stuff in the business like we all have. Um, But Thomas, you know, there are so few people who are completely who they represent themselves to be. And Thomas Jane is one of those rare people who is who exactly who he is. Um, And so I met met him. It was really funny. Um, uh, Someone I was I was working on a project gosh, back in 2012, you know, and it was a small film, uh, horror movie. And they CC'd me on an email where they said, oh, we're going to offer Thomas. We want him to come in and play the father in this horror movie just for a day. And then, um, you know, I'll email him directly. 
And so they emailed him and they made the offer. And I think Thomas wrote back and, you know, it's not for me. I don't want to play that, that kind of thing. Cause I have a young daughter and it was very personal to him, which I respected. He, he, it was about young children in the woods being tra- you know, terrorized. And he said, no, not for me. I have a young daughter. I, won't, I can't do it. Um, and so for some reason, I, I read this script, this um, Gothic prohibition era action script, which we are we've been working on for a while and God, when it finds the light, it's an incredible, it's such an incredible action piece. It's like John wick set in prohibition era, Chicago with an undead Al Capone. It's amazing. Anyway. Um, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. It's pretty, it's such a cool, uh, it's just one of the, one of my favorite projects. So I, you know, something about Thomas, I just, I emailed it to him and I said, TJ, uh, I didn't call him TJ yet. I said, you know, dear Thomas, um, you know, we, we were part of this interaction over this other film, um, that neither of us ended up doing. Um, would you be interested in, in looking at, at, at directing or looking at this film? It reminded me of the Punisher a little bit, the, the character. And he wrote back and he said, yeah, come over for tea and we'll talk about it at the house. And so, you know, I've never met Thomas. So I said, okay, okay. You know, um, He's so direct this way. Um, and usually, you know, I, I, in the business, you as, as a woman, you wouldn't say yes and go to anyone's house ever for a meeting. Oh, I, I was um, about I was about to say that was it didn't sound on paper. This is not it's not going well. <laughs> no, no, exactly. It, this is the whole thing. I, I you know, I said, oh, I don't know him. You know, so I so I, I got a friend of mine um, who had met with him before and said he's really nice. I said, come, good, come with me. We'll, we'll go and we'll suss out this situation from the front door. So, so if he shows up in a robe, not but, happening. Well, yeah, but I'm there with a with a tall man, you know, who's sure. right. So, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so because so went and the door's wide open. You hear like operatic music playing, and there's Thomas holding cups of tea, and amazing. he's like, "No, amazing!" And come on in. And so you know, we sat down on his deck, my, my, you know, my friend, myself and him, and we talked about the project and, you know, it was, he was just so brilliant. He's an encyclopedia of filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Um, he is the most sincere guy. I, I really, one of the most sincere people I've met in the business. And, um, you know, so we started talking about that project and, you know, left, just kept in touch via email about the project. And then we started talking about it more and more. And then he went off to shoot Predator. I think something else. And while he was up there shooting predators and then the expanse, he and I would do phone calls and we'd break down and everything was just about, he was so invested in getting the character right and the script, right. And so was I, and he and I together rewrote the script over, over a year and a half. And it was like beat for beat. And we would, we would just get into it. And it was like the, it was, you know, with the purest, uh, creative experiences I had had in the business. And so, um, ultimately I'm running a little long on the story, but it's all good. Uh, ultimately, um, when, you know, uh, ultimately in two, in 2018, um, I, I ended up, um, hospitalized for about four and a half months when I was pregnant with my son, um, in a really difficult situation. And Thomas and I, while I was going through that really terrifying time of not knowing what was going to happen. And my son was born healthily and everything. Um, he was there through that in the sense that he said, the projects we're working on court they will wait. There is nothing more important than what you're doing. And the team at paradigm said the same thing. And while I was there going through this really deeply personal, very difficult time, Thomas was just like, doesn't matter. We wait on all, on all projects we've been talking about till after, till this is all finished. Only that matters is this. And I'd never seen anyone really do that. Like actually take, you know, professional interests aside to respect something, you know? And so that happened. And then while I was there in the hospital, um, I, a chaplain came in, I was going through with this, you know, and I had this chaplain come in and I just started talking to them about life and many different things. And the chaplain sat back and said to me, character is revealed in a storm. And I said, it is, mm-hmm. it is. And I said, and, and I'm, in my mind, I said, you never know who you're going to be on the other side of the storm or who's going to be with you. And so 
you know, when all of that resolved, um, we ended up creating a company uh, called Renegade, you know, the following year. And the IP that we had talked about previously became formally optioned and part of our company. And um, our logo is a horse who is fashioned from the thing that it is afraid of most. You go through the fire and what happens if you become the fire? The character is revealed in the storm. And so Thomas and I, you know, have a, you know, that deep, longstanding kind of loyalty and trust that is really rare in the business. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. I was wondering what that logo was about. So uh, thank you for sharing the story. Now I have a few questions I ask all of my guests. Yes. If you've listened to the show, you know what they are. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Director or producer? Any, any, any filmmaker. Dealer's choice. Stay curious, reach out to as many people as possible, and you will find the authentic person who does want to help you find your way. Don't stop. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? (laughs) Sometimes people do not care who they hurt. And that can be one of the most profound disappointments, both professionally and personally. So that's deep. That's a good, that, out of 600 plus episodes I've done, that's, I've never heard that answer before. That was a very good answer. Um, very true though. Very, very true. That's that, that goes that stay skeptical, but stay open. Right. Because if you clock yourself off, you can't move forward. And, exactly. But if you're too open, you're going to get a lot of punches are going to come in. <laughs> Lots and lots of them. Now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Oh, okay. Um, I was looking forward to this one. <laughs> all right. Well, I already gave you one. Searching for Bobby Fisher. Obviously. Uh, Casino Royale. Oh, so good. <laughs> and actually Finding Neverland. Johnny's oh, Johnny movie. Yes. That, that was. Uh... And Kate Winslet. And that's right. Kate was in that as well. Um, that's, or as my daughters call her, Rose. Um, yeah, I, I really, I really wanted to, you know, Titan. I mean, a Gladiator and Titanic, and of course, Star Wars are like my three. Like they, they changed my life. But these were more character. I wanted, you know, Finding Neverland never gets, you know, a shout out, and it was such a beautifully crafted film. And of, Casino Royale is the best James Bond movie ever made. In my ever, life. ever made. You know, it's, um, it's, Haggis. That, just that script. Oh my god. And, and, and that's the thing about, and I always tell people like, why is that the best one is because that's the one that he became vulnerable. We just, we, he's not just a dude that sleeps with beautiful women and goes, kills and saves the day. Like in the, all the other ones, there was no character development. He never, he but, never arced. He never arced. But, but, like, and, but you know, they, and they gave the woman Eva green. I mean, Oh, so much. She, oh, so she's cool. the most complex, one of the most complex, uh, you know, women we've seen on screen, you know, and that's <sighs> what allowed him to become vulnerable. And, and it's funny, you, said, you know, the other night I had, I, I just, I felt I had this moment where I just needed to watch something that was made, God, 10 years ago, but Skyfall, you and know, it, that the making and the craftsmanship <sighs> of that movie is so mind blowing. And I had to go back and watch it just to remind myself like what, you know, the craftsmanship is because we're so busy chasing budgets down, you know, you just wanted to go and it, and it was, there's no, all that fancy CGI. It, it just, God, it's Sam Mendes at his finest with, with just the most incredible production. Um, so when you give, when you give masters a really good set of brushes and a great canvas, they can do some amazing things. I mean, Ridley, Ridley Scott, you, just, you know, I don't care what anyone says. Yeah, I, anything he does, I watch. Oh, because... Alien. You, you three movies. It's not fair to ask just three. Oh, Blade, throw, throw Blade Runner in there. I mean, yeah, there's oh. you know, Matrix in there, Fight Club. There's a bunch of them in there. Oh, Fight uh, Club. As well. But listen, Courtney, it has been an absolute pleasure and honor speaking to you. Uh, I hope that our conversation has helped a few filmmakers out there understand the business a little bit more. And uh, thank you for the inspiration uh, and uh, for the films that you're making. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. Thanks so much for having us and happy to answer questions anytime. 